States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. DeMonica. Mr. Dunnan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 to 0 with Mrs. Teal absent this evening. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, approval of minutes, regular meeting 10-9-2014, executive session 10-7-2014, executive session 10-9-2014. Pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. Mutter. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6-0. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, Rhode Island School Counselor Association Oscar Award recipients. Dr. Thornton. Mr. Mitchell. Good evening, everyone. If we could please have Cynthia Lancaster and Carrie Carlson come forward. Special recognition this evening. It is my pleasure to share this good news regarding these two counselors from McCourt Middle School, Kerry Carlson and Cynthia Lancaster. They have been given a prestigious award by the Rhode Island School Counselor Association for their outstanding work at McCourt. They were recognized for their work in three areas student ambassador program to welcome transfer students in grades six through eight conflict resolution lessons using a student-made video in grades 6 through 8, and HOPS, homework, organization, and planning skills to help struggling students in grades 6 through 8 as well. Cynthia and Carrie have met the requirements for recognition at the highest level, the Lighthouse Award. The Lighthouse Award is designed to recognize and promote schools working toward the American School Counselor Association National Model. The entire school district thanks you, Carrie and Cynthia, and we congratulate you on your fine work and this well-deserved recognition. Congratulations to you both, and thank you. Dr. Masterson, you, you get one too. Yeah, for the school to hang in the school. Let, let Dr. Masterson get in. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. They do all the work, but he, you know, bits Chairperson's report, funding formula in the BEP. Um, I believe uh, Alex will have some numbers available for us probably sometime early in November. We talked a little bit about how the uh, UCOA numbers are available. Um, they won't be audited numbers, but it will provide us some um, summary similar to what we've seen with the, uh, the prior three or four years of non-core and core expenses. So we should see those soon. Next item on the agenda is reports of standing committees. Payment of bills. Mr. Madam Chair, there are no payment of bills this evening. Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to fiscal management subcommittee update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Fiscal management met uh, Tuesday, this past Tuesday at uh, 5.30. We discussed which are this evening, uh, facilities cargo ban, the uh, gutter repair at uh, JJM Cullen Hill Elementary, and some chimney repairs that we also talked about, our 
energy financing, our energy project financing our resolution on the docket as well. And then the steps will report and some, uh, some, some discussion just uh, information only on the vehicle and the school. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next item, Policy and Procedures Subcommittee update. Will you be handling that this evening from uh, Chairperson Teal in her absence? Uh, I wish I wish I had been notified cool. of that prior because I, I would have loved to uh, yeah, handle that uh, handle that job. We would have had a meeting. Uh, so uh, so uh, the short answer is no. Wow. <laughs> you didn't mean so. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Salvatore. That was really helpful. <laughs> Next item, Achievement and Communication Subcommittee update. We did meet on Tuesday. We met with the high school um, uh, administrators and they talked a little bit about some of the redesign models that they'll be providing for a follow-up to a Gates grant. And what it provides is a, you know, a flexible model for students who may be looking for alternate type pathways for school. So those students that are challenged in their home life that may need a different type of schedule for those students who are uh, very advanced in their coursework that may need some flexibility so they can have um, alternatives. Um, there were four different models that we had looked at. It'll be part of a grant um, follow-up application that they're submitting to um, the New England Secondary School Consortium, and that will be occurring in December. And um, Assistant Principal Costa will be coming to, to the next school committee meeting um, for some update on that, we'll provide us with a bit of a presentation, and um, then they will submit it after that. So. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing, reading of the first policy. Oh, I'm sorry, reading of policy, new policy. It's the second reading. We did have a reading of it at the first committee meeting, which was B3, school committee meeting procedures and election of officers. You should all have it in your packet. I don't know if anyone had had any questions since the first reading. Excellent. And public comment, does anyone in the public wish to speak on behalf or for or against this policy this evening? And that would be B3, School Committee Meeting Procedures and Election of Officers. No, oh, huh. this meeting's going to go away rather quickly. All right, so we can call the public hearing closed. Next item is comments from the public. Anyone here wish to speak this evening? The rain really is quiet, everyone, you know? No? All right, moving on. New business, school safety plan update. Dr. Thornton. Good evening. Each year prior to the 1st of November, we must uh, approach the school committee and give an update on the uh, school safety plan code. So we're going to do that this evening with Dr. Matheson. He will give you um, a brief overview. You also have in your group of drives, I believe, a uh, rather uh, lengthy document. So we can start with uh, Jay's update and go to questions you may have on safety. Dr. Matheson. Uh, just have a brief presentation, kind of overview stuff. Um, a lot of it is actually public uh, on the Ryan website, so it's not uh, top secret, but the uh, top secret pieces are building specific, so those will be a little bit. Uh, just going through the big changes, uh, we're using emergency management language, uh, so we're not referring to Dr. Thornton as the superintendent anymore in a crisis. He is now considered the emergency operations center director. Uh, and that's so that when emergency personnel come onto the scene, we're all speaking common language. Uh, so, uh, actually, the safety plan is considered the crisis response incident plan. Uh, <coughs> we also have in the back, uh, as you probably have seen in the drive, uh, we also have forms for reimbursement for large casualties, uh, which we never had before uh, because of the standardized process. It's much easier for us to be able to work with the state and federal government on reimbursement for food or materials whatever you need for a crisis. Uh, you also notice that the plan you have in your drive is the McCord plan. Uh, that was made as the model for the district, which is easy for me to work on. Uh, and what it does is incorporates not only the school plan, but it has the district plan involved as well, so that 
everyone knows exactly what the district's going to react, how the district will react, and how schools will react to why. It'd be kind of a crisis situation. When you look at the building pace pieces, uh, it also carries on with the EOC type language. Uh, so I would be considered the incident commander uh, as the principal, uh, and it could keep the dues to go through that process. Uh, roles are specifically designed uh, and have responsibilities that are laid out clearly on a flow chart. Uh, so you have the name there and exactly what that person has to do. Uh, so that no matter what school you go to, it's pretty well laid out. Uh, it also has a flow chart for response to all types of uh, crisis, but it has a general sense that there's a flow chart that goes through just for an incident, uh, and then it goes off into the specific procedures based on whatever the incident is, whether it's a flood, a tree falling down, uh, losing power, uh, active shooter, bomb threat, uh, all those types of incidences. We also have a calendar of events that have to take place every year, so it goes through, for example, we're here today because we have to put this before you by November 1st uh, through legislation. We then have to report to RIDE that we did take care of this. Uh, that would be in the calendar. It would also go over how training takes place, by what time for faculty and staff, uh, and when plans have to be updated. Uh, so it really standardizes the process. Uh, it makes us responsible for our billing pieces and also uh, provides the district piece as well. As the chairman of the committee for the Cumberland, uh, I do oversee all the, these pieces with the education side as well as the municipal safety side with the emer uh, emergency uh, fire department and police department. We also are working to formalize our partnerships uh, with uh, off-site evacuation places. Uh, so for example, uh, we're working with uh, Indian Hope and St. Anita's Church uh, for McCord BF. Uh, so we're working on those types of things. They were in place before, but we really want to reformalize them all so that every, the administrations have changed. Uh, we want to make sure that they're all included in this new format and the new plan. So we'll be working with um, Mr. Adams or <coughs> office to make sure we take care of that. And we've been in contact on that, making sure we get that done. Uh, we also have our emergency administrative checklist uh, for preparedness, communication, emergency response, and recovery. Uh, so follows a specific procedure before, during, and after any incident whatsoever. One of the big changes that you may hear about uh, is how we actually call for emergencies. Uh, and I've gone over this uh, with Mr. Fiorillo a couple times last year. Uh, we are using plain language now. We don't have codes. Uh, codes, color codes went out six years ago. We went to plain language, but now it's even clearer. So for, I know it's an extreme example, but I do want to provide it just to kind of get a feeling for it. So if we call a lockdown, uh, we actually will say, right, at this time we're going to a lockdown, we have an intruder with a gray sweatshirt in the A-wing. That's how specific we're getting. Uh, so that uh, everyone in the building knows where the intruder is, uh, and if you are further from the situation, uh, we'll be trained teachers to be able to make decisions whether they're going to stay locked down or to uh, flee the building using our evacuation sites. Uh, so. That's the next step for our training. Once we get our calls, uh, they've been heard before you, we'll begin our training and go to that next. All the, call, all the calls that we have is considered all clear, lockdown, evacuation, shelter in place, dropped up, covering, and hold on, which is something we really don't have here with earthquakes, uh, and standby. Uh, we would do standby at this time, and you would provide instruction, standby, we're going to have restricted movement. And that's usually when we have medical personnel on the stand on the school grounds and we need to move someone from the nurse's office to the ambulance or uh, just to provide privacy. So our next steps is to meet and consult with our principals to make sure that we're clear on every uh, piece of our plans, uh, to update and meet with the safety committee, which we'll be calling a meeting uh, within the next month or so. And we need to retrain our faculty and staff. We also need to communicate with our families uh, any of the changes that we have regarding the plans uh, because of, for example, the calls that the kids are going to be hearing especially at the elementary level, it may be different uh, than what's expected. So we want to make sure our families are on, uh, on board with what we're trying to do uh, and they understand, and as well as finish those formal agreements we have with our businesses and organizations. And that's kind of like the overview. Right? Provide any time you would like to answer any questions. Activities and um, fine tuning along the way. 
do you meet locally and then the, some of the local officials meet statewide? So I guess the big question I have is if I'm a Cumberland resident or a Lincoln resident, are these plans generally guided by the state or is it local guidance? It's all, this entire document has been whittled down from 400 pages okay. and it's all state driven. Yep. Uh, so we all have uniform language, uniform forms. And the only pieces that are personalized are the pieces that have to do with our individual schools sure. and individual roles within those schools. Uh, so yes, if we went to Lincoln, their plans would look exactly the same, uh, with the exact same language. What typically happens is, because we have the Municipal Safety Committee with the education staff, uh, like the Chief of Police would go on trainings with the Police Department, and then we would meet as a safety committee, and they would report out what are some things that uh, they're hearing from the Chief's side, the Fire Department, have their trainings, and we end up sometimes going, and Captain Faye and I, and Officer Kolick, will go to trainings that are held throughout the year, put out by RIEMA. Uh, so we work in tandem in that sense. So we have separate trainings, and then we have trainings that are together, and we always bring it back to the safety committee, which Mr. DeMonica and Mr. Fiorello are members of. agenda discussion and our vote to approve alternative alternate destination for CHS overnight field trip scheduled for June 2015. Okay, two meetings back, as you may recall, you approved a trip to uh, South Africa for the high school. As you know, we have some things going on in Africa in terms of a medical situation. So the tour company EF had advised a lot of the high schools to maybe rethink their trips. Having said that, Ashley Crew and Linda Borden uh, came to me to propose an alternative to South Africa. So I want to bring it back to you to uh, have you uh, take a look. Ladies. Hi. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you for approving the Holocaust trip. We went this past June. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. 35 kids. We all made it back safe and sound. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, so last year we saw approval for the South Africa trip and everything was fine until Ebola. Um, and right now the way EF works is they don't cancel trips unless the CDC says it's not safe. And the CDC says it's safe. Um, but between parental concern and just trying to err on the side of caution because we have children with us, probably not going to be a great idea come June. Um, so I talked to EF about what our options were. and. EF said that you spend a lot of money with us and you can cancel the trip, which totally negates the purpose of seeing other cultures and learning new things. He said, but we have a promise to you that if you pay to travel and for whatever reason you can't go to the location you choose, we'll send you to a second or third choice. I said, great, we don't have to change anything, we're covered. And then they said, wait a minute, no, we kind of didn't really explain it very well. And they came back a couple of days later and said, well, try to send you to your second or third choice, but if we can't, we're just going to send you somewhere. So we could end up anywhere in the world, and that's silly. So we looked at our different options, and while the Holocaust trip and the South Africa trip had that very strong social justice theme with apartheid and tracing the Holocaust, um, that's not the only class that I teach. Um, I also teach um, a class that I created for the high school anthropology, which is a marriage of the hard sciences and the social sciences. And so Ms. Borden and I decided to propose a joint trip that does just that, and it marriage, marriages, marries the hard sciences and the social sciences. Um, it's a trip to Ecuador, uh, Rio Bamba, and the Galapagos Islands. It would travel at the exact same time as the South Africa trip would travel. Um, in mentioning to the kids who had already signed up for South Africa, we have 13, I said, you know, we have to be real here. This is probably not going to last. We have to be prepared for something else. And I said, this is something that I'm willing to propose. Are you all okay with it? And 100% of the students and parents on board said, that if this location was approved, they'd be okay with it. So that was a good first step. Um, so um, I have a quick PowerPoint for you. Um, this was one of the photographs from when we went to Europe. This was taken in Prague in front of Babel Castle that was built in the 1300s. Um, it, um, an amazing trip. I have thousands of pictures. It's hard to pick just one. Um, but what they gained from going to Ecuador um, versus Eastern Europe or South Africa really doesn't change too much. It's a lot about interacting with history, um, seeing new cultures, learning about different places in the world. For me, travel for students is really important because we live in a small town in southern New England and I want them to see the world and all the very different places that there are. 
Um, and so this particular trip offers them a chance to learn the history of a different place, the culture of a different place, and really get hands-on experience on the science side, the ecology, environmental science. Um, but Ms. Borden is the expert on that, so I'll let her talk about that in a minute. Um, out of five stars, it gets 4.6 reviews. It's one of the top chosen trips on EF. This is from students, parents, teachers, and group leaders who have gone on this trip in the past. Um, the website has all those reviews from the three reviews that get two stars to all the ones that get five stars. So when we go, if we go, if we're approved, um, we will fly into Quito. Uh, we'll stay there for four nights. Um, we will then fly to the Galapagos from there, stay there for a few nights, come back, stay in Quito again. We'll travel by day to different cities. And then the add-on at the end of the trip is a three-day excursion to the Andes where we get to stay in Rio Bamba and we do cultural immersion work with the indigenous people there. Um, so again, uh, we will be staying in Quito, we'll be staying in the Galapagos Islands, and we'll be staying in Rio Bamba, but we'll also be going to Otavalo, Cotacachi, and Mitad del Mundo as well on day trips. Um, just a couple of pictures of some of the amazing places they'll see. Um, Otavalo is the largest handicraft market. It's where all the indigenous people are doing the handmade crafts and the amazing things that you can see. This is one of the opportunities where students will have to actually sit down and make these crafts and learn how these people do these things by hand. Um, the Charles Darwin Research Station established on the Galapagos. Um, this is where the giant tortoise breeding sanctuary is, so they will have hands-on work with the tortoises as well. Um, cathedral de Riobamba is the largest cathedral in Riobamba. And Imbabura Volcano is just south of Quito, but I'm not exactly sure where. Um, comprehensive list of everything we get to do. You have two itineraries that I sent you by email. One is a color copy that's actually um, very vague, and I told the EF person that there's not enough information here, so she gave me a sample itinerary of the, all the stuff we would be doing. I sent both of those to you to look at. But here's a list of some of the places we'll see and the things we'll get to do. And if you ever wanted to, you know, institute a dress code, like a uniform, that could be one. Um, but we get to go, um, as far as the social side, the cultural side for me, it's the work of being with people who are different from us. And we spend, we don't live with them, we stay in hotels. But for four days and three nights, we are in the Indian highlands, and we are working with the children in the schools, or doing their farming with them, or their handicrafts, and things like that. And it's all about really seeing how another group of people live, and understanding that while it's so easy to see the differences among all of us, what we really have to look at are the commonalities among us all. Um, yeah, this is why I always used to travel. Um, I love them. They take really good care of us. Um, there's an all-inclusive coverage plan. I know last year um, it was made mandatory through school policy, but even before that I always made it policy. $155 is worth it when you're sending your child across the world. It covers everything from lost baggage to if they get sick to if there's a delay in flights, anything. Um, we have a 6 to 1 chaperone ratio, so for every 6 students that goes, 1 adult goes. Um, when I went to Europe this past summer, the ratio was actually lower because we had teachers pay to travel. So we had extra sets of eyes. 24-hour um, emergency on-call service. There is an EF uh, office in Ecuador. And then they're all over the world as well. Uh, it's fully accredited. There are multiple licensing bodies um, that accredit this. It's completely educational. Um, one of the students who went to Europe after the second day, she said, I thought this was going to be vacation. I didn't know we were supposed to be learning so much. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, not the way it works. Um, we have a tour director 24-7 with us. They're bilingual, which always helps when you're in another country. They're in the hotels with us, on the tour bus at every site. They, they don't leave our side. Um, the nice thing about EF is that you know you're paying the lowest price for really good quality travel. Um, they're the largest travel student travel company in the world. I looked at using other ones like Explorica, and EF was cheapest by <coughs> somewhere between $500 and $1,000 every single time. So I thought it was worth it. Uh, they and they take care of all the details. We show up, I take care of the kids, they show us around and they take care of everything else. And the peace of mind program is if something should happen, they will make sure we're okay. Um, this is just a map to show you where all those EF offices are so that you see that we're not alone. We had an emergency come up in uh, Poland. Rain caused us to be three hours late for our scheduled tour at Auschwitz. And with over a million people going there every year, you can't just show up whenever you want. You have to schedule a visit. 
and if you miss it, you miss it. Um, and so we called the office in Lucerne and they made some phone calls and got straightened out by the time we finally arrived and it all worked out perfectly. So they are there to help if anything happens. Um, this trip is not private like my Poland trip. The Poland trip was private because I told EF I didn't like their Holocaust trip. I wanted to do more intensive Holocaust studies and so they created a special trip for me. This trip is awesome, just as it is. And so what that means is if it's approved and we travel, we will not be by ourselves on the trip. There will be other schools from around the country who are also sending their students and teachers there. So not only do our students have the opportunity to meet people of a different culture in another country, but they get to meet kids from around our country as well. Um, they've given us a date range for travel because they can't guarantee it two years out. Um, the earliest day that we will fly out would be June 15th, so not on wood even with snow days. Um, the kids won't miss school, and then our latest arrival day back would be July 3rd. So it's still in that same window for the South Africa, of when the South Africa trip would be. Another bonus is cheaper. Um, right now, the South Africa trip is $4,870 for students, um, almost $5,000 for paying adults. This trip is, I'm really blind, you can't see that from here, $4,000, what does that say? So Thank you, Forty-one sixty for students. Um, the monthly payment is about the same as South Africa, but that's because students have been paying for South Africa for a lot longer. Um, so it is much cheaper. In mentioning this to the students who were traveling to see if they would be okay with changing this location if you approved, of course other students found out. Um, knowing that it's not official yet, we've said we'll let you know if it is, but we've had a sharp increase in interest on this trip. Uh, Ms. Borden can speak more to that for the science classes, but I know in my anthropology class and a lot of the global studies classes as well, they've been like jumping at me every time they see me asking if it's been approved. So it is exciting to know that even more kids would potentially travel. Um, the all-inclusive coverage plan that I talked about covers everything from say, I don't know, there's a tornado, or no, that would be a hurricane, a hurricane, and we can't travel, we fly out a day late, they would be reimbursed for that day's expenses that they paid. Um, illness, if they fall and twist their ankle and have to go to the hospital, not only does it pay all their medical coverage, it flies mom and dad out to be with them and fly them back home. If you lose your luggage, if there's a delay in the flight, all of that stuff is covered, 155 bucks is worth it. Um, so that's included in the price. And here's everything it includes. Uh, round trip airfare, not just from the states to Ecuador, but intracontinental airfare as well, and accommodations. So it, they say it's the equivalent of three-star American hotels. In Europe, they were beautiful. They were all brand new, state-of-the-art hotels, except for one which was older. And when I say older, it was 700 years old. It was this amazing old mansion. Um, so you can't really complain there. Um, the hotels are all safe. Almost every single meal for all 11 days. They are responsible for, I think. It's like, it's like four lunches is all they have to pay for most every meal, and they're spending money. Um, it covers professional guided site, uh, professional licensed tours of all the cities and of all the sites, and entrance to every place that we go. So everything but they're spending money and a couple of meals is covered on the trip. <coughs> the college credit for it, if they want, they can earn high school credit, but I encourage them not to do that because we have amazing electives at the school already, and a lot of these kids are juniors and seniors anyway. Um, so either through Eastern Washington University or Eastern Oregon, fully accredited, fully transferable. They do a little work before, during, and after the trip, and they've got a humanities credit that can follow them wherever they go. It's a free bonus to paying for this trip, and most of my students who have signed up already have already contacted EF about doing it, so it's a great thing for them. The only thing students are responsible for is their making sure they have a passport, and I take care of that. I don't pay for it. I make sure they have it in time. Uh, if they decide to check extra baggage, they have to pay for that. Um, we do pay tips to our director, our bus driver, and our guides. It's customary, it's standard. Chaperones pay it, students pay it. Um, and then their own spending money, obviously. Um, and for rules, I basically tell students that I expect you to follow all rules that you follow in the building. Um, so even though we're you know, thousands and thousands of miles from home, if it's against the rules of CHS, it's against the rules on trip, and if you don't follow these rules, there are no warnings, there are no second chances. You go home on a red-eye one-way flight at your parents' expense. Students and parents both sign a <coughs> form that talks about behavioral expectations, what's okay, what's not okay, so it's very clear from, from the start. Luckily, I had no behavioral issues um, 
as far as you know, making bad choices and drinking or anything like that on the last trip. So it worked out really well for us. There's another picture of my group. We were in Prague. It was freezing cold. It was raining for about 13 miles that day. It was so fun. Um, so thank you. I know I went really fast. Do you have any questions for us? Mr. Fiorello. I'd just like to thank you for the detailed presentation. <laughs> always no, I'm, I'm very serious. This should be the benchmark for every presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I think the school committee needs to plan a trip somewhere because these sound really exciting. You could go. I'm oh, just saying. Oh, we could go. Chaperones. Yes. <laughs> um, is there a cap on the number of students that can go, seeing that it sounds like it's really generated some interest? I don't. I personally don't cap because for every six kids that sign up, a chaperone goes, and they also do a prorated um, fee for chaperones. So. Right now we have 13 kids, so two chaperones are traveling. Say we got 15, that's not enough for a free spot for a third chaperone, but they take the adult price and they reduce it by half, basically. They reduce it by one-sixth for every kid over, and so the adults who are partially paying or still chaperone get a really great deal for it. I don't choose to cap it simply because if you want to go and you want to learn, go. The only thing that I say to students is if I don't know you personally, if I haven't taught you, and sometimes even if I have, um, I'm going to talk to your teachers, your guidance counselor, your administrator. If you struggle with following rules at school, and I don't know if you can follow rules internationally, then we're going to have a talk about whether it's a good idea for you to travel or not. I had a student who had been written up a lot and had been caught smoking on campus and skipped school a lot, and she wanted to sign up. And I said, I'm going to ask your teachers and your guidance counselor about all of this stuff, and then we'll talk. And we talked, and she... I said, this is what I found out. This is what your, your, your teacher said. She's like, yeah, maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, so that's my only caveat is if, if you can't follow school rules, we have to have a long conversation about expectations. I had 49 travelers for Europe um, at the peak. And with any trip, travelers fall off um, for whatever reason. And so it went down to 35, but I, I personally don't cap it unless the school told me they wanted me to. As long as there's adults to watch them, we're good. Right. Are the kids <clears throat> alone at all by themselves? Do they get a free day? You know, like, they wow. never get a free day, ever. They usually get around two hours at lunchtime, and it's not a free-for-all. So usually what will happen, for example, in Krakow, there's an area called Old Town. It's basically a large square with shops and restaurants. And we would say, okay, it's 11.30 a.m., meet you back here at 1.30. You get lunch while you're gone, you can shop, you can listen to the, watch the street performance, and we'll see you back. And then the chaperones and I would run recon the entire time, and so we would be walking around watching where they were going. But it's never, a, all right, I'll see you at dinner, or I'll see you tomorrow morning. And they're in groups? They're in groups. We, the minimum is two students. You're never allowed to be by yourself ever. If we catch you by yourself, you are now stuck at our side 24-7 because you've shown that you aren't mature enough to go by yourself. Oftentimes, we mandated three to four to a group, especially if it was evening. Like if we had dinner and it was on the square, we'd say, okay, no, more, no less than four people per group, and we would have them group up before we let them go. And your four other trips, it went smooth doing it like that? I've never had an issue as far as the free time, but I think a big part of that is having trustworthy and really hardworking chaperones who are helping me, like I said, run recon on the kids. And we tell them, like, we're watching you at all times. You don't see us but we're watching you. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it. I mean, obviously I don't they're... get so concerned with the kids as I get so concerned with the people that live down there. Right. One of the things we talk about, I have two mandatory meetings before we, before we leave. And the rule is if you don't attend those meetings, I'm not allowing you to fly out. And the first meeting is all about safety. So it's pickpocket awareness, um, you know, never carrying a lot of cash on you. I was shocked. I did not mandate students wear the uh, passport thing around the neck or the fanny pack. I would say three quarters of my students wore it anyway um, to keep their money. You know, while it's in the front pocket, when we were in busy areas, hold your bag in front of you. Um, to the best of my knowledge, no one was stolen from. Nobody came and said, hey, all my money's missing. But most of my kids did a really good job of really not bringing any cash with them. It was all ATM access. 
Um, the other really good thing with EF is they're putting us up in places that are safe. So, for instance, we actually really scared the kids. We drove into Prague. We got to Prague at about 8.30. It was dark already. And we said, all right, Prague's a bigger city. Give us your passports. We're going to put them in the safe at the hotel. And you should have seen the kids' faces. They got petrified. It actually worked for us really well because they were watching their P's and Q's. They had their bags in front of them. Many chose not to bring their bags with them to Old Town. Um, and it wasn't that Prague was unsafe, but we were just trying to be as safe as possible. And so I try to put fear of God in them early on. And so they really know what to look for and how to behave. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Just a quick question. So this is this will occur after school is is released, is yes. that correct? Yes. And how, how do you, um, obviously it's a great trip, but how do you engage the students beforehand in your classes? So, so there's the science and then there's the anthropology. I'll let you speak for science because I've been doing it. <laughs> Thanks. So I think that uh, if you think back to your high school sciences, everyone remembers Darwin. So there's obviously a connection to our biology, AP bio, and environmental classes already. Um, what is exciting about this trip for our kids that are really into science is what is difficult for us in the high school setting is making science real and alive. They will have the opportunity to do field work, which a lot of kids think they're interested in it, but until you experience it, you don't know if that's a lifestyle that you can handle or that you want to go and do. So the curriculum tie-ins are already there, and it'll just engage the students even further if, hey, I'm going here, and I'm learning about it right now. What, what am I going to go see? In, in my class, I just constantly mention it. Um, for example, it's so easy with anthropology. The first half of the year is all Darwin. It's all evolution. Um, we start from simple genetics with Mendel, and we go all the way up to hominoid and hominid evolution. Um, and then as far as cultural culture, that's my second half of the year. Anthropology is a study of how humans are alike and how they're different, past and present. Um, so we look at the science side, and then we look at the social side. And so it's a, well, when we go, this is what you're going to see. This is not how we do it here. Um, it was easy in my Holocaust course and history courses as well to say, you know, when you're talking about the Holocaust, or you're talking about anti-Semitism or racism or prejudice or whatever, you can reference back. Um, and so for me, I, I just constantly talk about it. Like they, they're, they don't have a choice, but they have to hear it. Um, so when we go, this is what it would look like, or this is what we'll do. Like you said, it, it's making it... It's making it come alive. It's not just words in a book anymore. It's real stuff that they're going to see and touch and feel. Thank you. I'm even more excited. Than you. <laughs> Thanks very much, ladies. Okay, so we have a discussion and a vote to approve alternate destination, alternate exciting, cool destination <laughs> for CHS overnight field trip scheduled for June 2015. The pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. Fiorello, second by Mr. Denon. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And then a motion carries 6 0. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll have some very excited children tomorrow morning. <laughs> I hope so. Next item discussion and or vote to approve second reading of new policy B3 school committee meeting procedures and election of officers. I, yes, Mr. Mutter. Madam Chair, <coughs> Ms. Teal, uh, this is a, a, a particular policy that's near and dear to uh, Teal's uh, heart. I have just one question um, for Mr. Adams. It says under election and duties of school committee officers, and it says that uh, they shall be elected by a vote of the majority of the full committee at the organizational meeting. Should we remove the word full there, just in case not every member was at the organizational meeting? Was that going to happen? That would be the pleasure of the committee. I'm not being flippant, but... Well, I'm just saying it's just a full committee. What happens if there's one, one, one member is not there? Is that still a full committee? I think a fair reading of that, because as you might be aware, under Title 16, there are certain statutes that require the full committee to be present. 
and those statutes have been interpreted to mean the full committee. So yes, I think if that policy uses the term full, arguably it means full. So you may not want it to mean full, or you may. That one I can't so maybe, decide for you. So then we all, you also have the option of you know, just tabling it, waiting it for uh, the next oh, meeting oh, as well. Oh, is that, would that oh, be an option oh, as well? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be a healthy option. Wouldn't be a healthy option. I'm going to move to amend that line of to remove the, uh, the word full. Mr. Motion, Mr. Motion, Mr. Mutter moves to amend the line to delete the word full. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Salvatore. All those in favor? Those opposed? That motion carries 6 0. Madam Chair? Mr. Mutter. Um, you know, for those who were in, uh, Policy subcommittees. This, this isn't, you know, I just for the record, this isn't one of my, uh, you know, my favorite policy that Ms. Teal has directed us uh, admirably over, over the years. But um, I'm going to make a motion to approve as amended. Mr. Meyer moves to pass B3 as amended, second by Mr. Salvatore. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Those, those opposed? That motion carries 6 0. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Really? All right, so that um, is now an approved policy. Next item on the agenda, thank you, Mr. Mutter, um, is a discussion and or vote to approve amended resolution SCR 2014 11A Energy Projects Financing. I believe that's for you, Mr. Mutter. Madam Chair, uh, uh, this particular resolution was in front of uh, fiscal management, and as everyone is uh, aware, uh, we were, this was on the last docket, and uh, we tabled it due to uh, a request for uh, a bond council opinion on, you know, whether or not it's appropriate for the school committee to enter into debt service. Um, in this particular case, it's 690000 but the question was, you know, what is the number? Is it what happens if it was six million? And um, is it? Am I correct in understanding that we did not receive any communication with respect to uh, a bond council opinion? Correct. So I, I mean, I, I think that. So I, I'm trying to be good. <coughs> I was going to be good tonight, you know. But so I'm going to try to be good. But you know, this is like the second time. Right? There was this. There's this issue that you know, it the question was actually asked um, because of the mayor's in, um, desire to get that uh, question answered, and and so why we don't have an answer is similar to the you know I don't I don't really understand why we don't have an answer, and you know to me that's a, uh, you know whether someone's my friend or not, but in, in matters like in matters, certainly in matters of the government here, it's, it just doesn't matter. We, uh, we asked the question, we tabled it, uh, and I think appropriately we tabled it to get an answer, and we didn't get one. Um, so, so, so my first point would be that, you know, that I'd be disappointed, I'm disappointed at that, I think. I think you always have to be uh, looking, however, for, um, you know, the, the, the right thing to do in the right way, so you, you shouldn't grow tired of that. So, and I, I think that, uh, so, you know, I wrestle with the fact that, uh, there was certainly an, an, enough time, and the entities are close enough to that, that uh, we should have had an answer. And I, you know, so it's at my last meeting, and we should have had an answer to the last question. We never got an answer to as well. And I think that anybody who's a, a fan of, uh, you know, good government says the two bodies should uh, work together. It starts with uh, uh, the, the respect of when you get a question, even you know, you answer, even if it's when you don't want to answer, even if you think someone threw it at you at the last minute, you answered the question. And it's, it's you know, so, they're related and, and they're not related. So, uh, you know, I'm disappointed in that. I, we've obviously vetted this issue a number of times. I don't know for those, if, if Mr. Pernana wants to make, a, you know, or a chair if you want someone to make a, a small presentation on the issue. I know it's been in front of us a number of times. The only question is that, for the record, if you could, uh, if you could uh, state whether or not this is reimbursable, uh, this uh, project, and if you wanted to make, a, you know, for, for people new to the scene on this issue, maybe a, a, a quick, a quick uh, presentation.
presentation on it. After that, my feeling is, as I said, you know, in committee is that we play on, and I would be um, moving past of this, but I think just for edification, we can make a quick presentation on that. Like, that would be nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is the, um, this all, this, this started as a, if you recall, we were looking um, last summer to actually do a, a master lease from a 10 year master lease from $1.8 million worth of improvements um, throughout the throughout many of our buildings in the in the district. And when we found out that Ride had continued a moratorium on reimbursing for school construction aid, we pulled back because it, it doesn't make sense to spend that money and lose 45 cents on every dollar that we spend. So um, we pulled back, but we decided to try to do a smaller project, about $600,000 of some areas that we really felt needed to be done as soon as possible, that there'd be in this project about $60,000 worth of you know, annual savings. And um, it fell in to the amount of uh, allocation, old allocation we had um, with, the, with, uh, with Rye that we would get reimbursed on, the, on this amount of money. This pretty much brings us to the end of that old money. We now need to get um, our stage one, stage two plans eventually approved so that when the moratorium is lifted, when we do capital projects, we will get reimbursed the stuff. But so anyhow, we, we downsized this project to do a couple of our worst boilers in the district and this building and in the uh, North Cumberland Middle School, I guess you go by North Cumberland Middle School in the winter, it's 10 degrees out and every window is open. It's just completely, you know, uh, you know inefficient. And then we also wanted to put a couple of energy management systems in where we already had systems, but they had been fell into disrepair in the 90s for lack of maintenance. So for rather short money, about $93,000, we could get three schools up and running, you know, where we'd be able to control temperatures and fans and other things. Um, and then there was also a small amount of money to do some we uh, weatherization on a couple of schools that we've had. Um, Dr. Thornton will know, but we've had actual leaks, you know, because pipes are not properly uh, protected from the outside weather and stuff, and especially at Community and, um, and Ashton. So um, we, we downsized the project, and we, um, we, we, were we were going along trying to do this tax exempt. We learned from Bond Council that, be, you know, because there was, um, the town had a $10 million limit on bank held, um, bonds that, and they had already issued eight and a half million, and they had some other plans. I think the water supply board and others that they're looking to do. That they recommended we don't we don't do this tax exempt. That it would mess maybe mess up the town's plans. So we looked at doing it taxable. And I had a verbal discussion with um, one of the uh, individuals at um, at. Uh, is it uh, Alfonso and Moses? I'm not sure of the name. I know they merged or whatever. And uh, who said that if it's a tax release, there's not an issue. Um, I double checked with the finance director and I told him, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Brian, but did you have a conversation? He goes, yeah, it's my understanding too if it's taxable, but we never did get anything in, uh, we never did get anything in writing. Uh, I would suggest, even if we do this, just to give the school committee some comfort I know some bond council people that you know we can we can maybe get our own opinion to be you know one hundred percent comfortable you know so the committee's comfortable, but you know we can pass it. I'll get the, I'll get another opinion if you want. We don't have to go to Alfonso and Moses as many you know there's other companies out there and uh, just to you know so that you people are comfortable. But we would like to get this work going. We waited a couple of weeks. Um, you know with the you know I don't know if it'll cost us any money or anything because we want to actually get these boilers in so we achieve all the savings that we can this winter. And, uh, you know, the, the, at some point, I, I'm not sure when the vendors will say, you know, this price, I can only hold this price up to a certain period on these expensive boilers. The boilers are about almost 500,000 of the 640 that we're looking to spend. So I think, you know, I, I hope that catches people up a little bit on where we are and just a little how we started last summer with a much bigger project, but a downsized it at this point. So not really, but, you know, at this point, and, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to me uh, and, um, if you want to tell us, clearly, um, 
I think the lack of, I'm going to interpret the lack of an answer to mean that it, it's permissible. Uh, I'm going to move passage of SCR 2014-11A. Mr. Mutter moves passage of SCR 2014-11A. Mr. Fiorello seconds it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Thanks, Mr. Mutter. Next item, discussion in or vote to approve awarding of bids. SCPR 10, 2014-16, Facilities Cargo Van. Mr. Mutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this was in front of uh, Disco Management this past Tuesday and is, is coming forward with uh, other recommendation. Uh, I passed out. If you recall, uh, you know, uh, when we amended our budget in July and August, one of the, one of the things we had, we had, we had put money aside in the business office for a possible debt service payment on this lease we're talking about that we just, uh, that the committee just passed uh, because we weren't sure who, would, um, who the low bidder might be and whether there would be a requirement to have a debt service you know, payment in the current year budget. We've, uh, we've worked it out where the first payment will be a year in the arrears, like many master leases are, so that we've, we learned about in, back in August that we wouldn't need um, to put that money in, in, in the budget this year. Rather than cut it out of the budget, what the committee did is they moved it to the facilities budget for additional capital items. And, and what we did is, if you look, I pass out, this is page 47 of the budget, and the money that we would use to pay for this is the last line that other improvements, we put a another improvement line item in there for $30,000 in case there was something came up that we would need. So that's that page 47. The reason it wasn't really put in the budget, we'd spent a lot of money on it, and, um, and you know, the budget went in in March and April, and we were getting by with it and that type of stuff, and it kept breaking down and stuff, and, 
it, and so um, it wasn't in the original school committee budget because we had spent money, it was working a little bit, but it, it continues to be a problem, it's not reliable. What we have now, and it's the plumber's vehicle, so he has the basically more um, equipment and tools and things to carry them, to, to carry around than any of the other, um, you know, different trades. And um, so what we're doing now is he's either uh, borrowing a truck and we're doubling up other people, or on occasion he'll use his vehicle and get reimbursed miles, but he, he's hoping that's a temporary thing. He doesn't want to use his own vehicle. And, um, I, you know, so, but he has been doing, a, you know, some of it with the hopes that we would get this uh, addressed. The other sheet I handed out is the kind of the, the, uh, the fleet we have. Um, you can see we bought a 2012 a few years ago for the carpenter assistant. We brought a, a Silverado, and you're going back from there, it's 2008 or 2007, and then, you know, then it's, everything's 10 to 14 years old with, you know, with high mileage. So we actually should try to put in a plan where we replace, you know, similar to what we're doing with food service. We, I know we have a stream of revenue for that, and so it makes it, a, you know, an easier decision, but we've got that a five-year capital plan going where we're replacing you know, uh, you know, uh, old kitchen equipment and that type of stuff. And we should do something like that with this so that we don't end up one year having to buy three vans or, you know, that type of stuff and, and continue to, uh, you know, put poor money into vans that are, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. You know, I would recommend that we try to buy a van or so every other year or so and try to keep the fleet staggered so you never, it, it, it doesn't all age at one time, you know. That's all I have to have. I just had one more question that I didn't ask that night. So this, I, I do believe that I did ask you on that night though if this was bought, this was purchased new. I think this was originally purchased new, this van. The one that's being replaced, do you know? Oh, wow. It, it was in 2000, Jeff, and I don't know if it was new or not back then. But, okay. So, so but 2000, you know. What does the, just, for, just quickly, what, what does the plumber do? I'm just wondering, I, he just works at the schools? Yeah, he works at, the, he's all over the district, at the, the schools, he's got, you know, all the tools that you can imagine. That, he has that much work to put on. He does. 149,000 miles per Well, that, that, that's why, I, don't, that, I asked the same thing of Wayne, and neither one of us know if it, if, you know, if it was, we might, they might have bought that van with, you know, certain mileage on it. And, that, and, and that's exactly, uh, that's exactly why we put stickers on them recently, and, and, Wayne, and Wayne and I wash the mileage now so that, you don't want to have someone using a van because you're right. There should be there should only be two, three thousand miles put on these vans a year. It shouldn't be five, six, ten thousand miles. So that's something we watch for now. But I can't tell you what how, what was on these uh, vans back in two thousand. I just can't. Thank you. Mr. Salvatore. Mr. Pignano. Good afternoon. Just it have to be a, a cargo van? Can it be one of those newer, smaller, like type of vans? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's, not like, it's a cargo van. Is that one of those big vans? Can it be one of those smaller little vans? I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking to replace what they have. I don't know the, you know, I'm not sure what you're talking about. It's a small one. It's a big truck. Does he need a big van? No, it's not. It's not. So this new one is not one of those big vans. And also, the second part of my question is, what's going to happen with the old man? Um, I, I don't know if there's any salvage value or not. We would try to trade it, I guess, or whatever. But I don't know if there's any value to it. Trade this. We'll take it off. We're not, we're not going to put it back on the road. Well, I mean, does this price reflect the trade? No, it doesn't. That was a new. That was, that was new. So the man will stay here until who figures out? Oh, I would try to. I would try to trade it to whoever we did. You know, if we go to police, I would try to trade it to them, see what we can get for it. Not to be disrespectful, should, should the town? There, there's a there's a policy regarding the disposition of assets, right? So that, so that it would need to it would need to. We'd have to notify the finance director, and the rest of them that would take it off the road. I I don't have a policy in front of me, so I don't know exactly what it says. But we would want. Yeah, it to requires us to notify the town and stuff. I don't think the town will want this piece. I don't think they're going to want to inherit this this piece of equipment. Yeah, but we can't assume. No, we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, just my background in inside sales for HVAC supply houses. This is a very common service van for a plumber or HVAC tech. 
I think that the plumber is going to need a he needs a vehicle that works. We need to have a better oversight of all of our fleet. I think this is where we start the conversation. I think we need to do this. Um, we can't have the plumber using his own. I think he's using a box truck, which is using a, a ton of gas. And I'm going to put more money into a van that's going to keep breaking down. I would make a motion to approve SCR. I'm sorry, SCPR 10. 16 to facilitate Mr. Fiorello moves passage of SCPR 10, 2014-16. Do I have a second? I have a second. Are you seconding? Seconding for discussion? Can I second for discussion? Later? Yes, you can. Thank you. I'm still, and again, no disrespect, what kind of van is it? Is it a big van? Is it a small van? If we're only doing three to 4,000 miles a year, does it have to be a big van? Big van that, that's putting out the gas. You need a certain size of the I can try. I haven't seen the van. I know there are there are actually bins in the van for plumbing parts. I'm not an expert on how small you can go, but these are a lot of bins, a lot of parts that you have, a lot of plumbing pieces. Okay. I'm not a plumber, I'm not a specialist. I'm just curious why a big van for twenty-three thousand. I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's that big. I mean I think it's there it's Similar to all the the vans, the other vans that we currently have. It's actually a twenty five hundred, so it's a three quarter ton. And in most, I agree with Mr. Fiorello, most people in that industry would be um, using a vehicle very similar to that, if not that uh, that size. So that's that's for sure. I, I don't. Uh, I'm not going to hold it up. Uh, my, my point isn't about needing it. My point is still about the procedure. And, you know, even at my last meeting, I have to, I have to keep whacking. You know, but, <laughs> I mean, it's not. It, it didn't show up, and uh, and uh, the documentation could be tighter uh, as to. And I really don't know. You know, I, I haven't seen it as to uh, how many repairs. I think the mileage is a little is something that, uh, and I'm not insinuating anything. It's certainly something we should be looking at. So. Um, it's not a perfect world, but it's still a for things. I'm sure. This is um, DPW Director Frank Stark did approach me this morning at the donor shop. I do. He did indicate he does want the van. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Fiorello. After having read the way that the ordinance is about assets, I do not believe that the assets of the school may fall under requirement for town departments to do that. I agree that we should offer it, but I don't think we're actually bound to do it. Any, any further discussion? Yeah, I was going to make a short quote about a box. I was going to pay for it. Mr. Devitt. Um, how does the insurance work? So we have, a, we have a, an amount for the purchase of the vehicle, but how does the insurance work? This will be, it'll be added to our policy that we have with the trust. We spend $170,000 a year as a liability, casualty, right. in front. I don't know if it's in the facilities budget, if you want to see that line. Any more questions? All right, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? That motion carries 5-1 with Mr. DeMonica dissenting. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, SEPR 10, 2014-17, gutter repair, install retention system at JJM Cumberland Hill Elementary School. Uh, we're we're uh, pulling that, re that resolution right now. We don't want that acted on. Would you like it tabled? Tabled. Or, yes? I'll move to tabled. Mr. Meyer moves to table SCPR 10, 2014-17. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fiorello. All those in favor? Those opposed? That motion carries 6-0. Next item, SCPR 10, 2014-18. Chimney repairs at BF Norton School and JJM Cumberland Hill Elementary School. Are there two um, resolutions for chimney repairs? One for just Cumberland Hill alone? Um, as it's agended, it's Cumberland Hill 
Hills and JJM. Or I'm sorry, VF North and JJM. As we sent another one forward yesterday, so such as Cumberland Hill alone. The way that it's agenda says BF Norton and Cumberland Hill, but the resolution itself says um, Cumberland Hill. Is it for 11500 Yes, sir. Okay. That is just for Cumberland Hill. So if you want to amend the wording to just say Cumberland Hill and not BF Norton, substituted us a, a, a new resolution of wanting just the Cumberland Hill at this time. Right, so we stopped once again. So this says, its agenda is generated here as a BF North School and JJM Cumberland Hill Elementary School. Can we, can we make a sweeping change to, to that, uh, whereas uh, this resolution is only going to be for Cumberland Hill, uh, Cumberland Hill Elementary, or can we make that change on the fly? You're asking if you can amend it? Um, well, it's agenda that has chimney repairs at BF North School and Cumberland Hill. If we wanted to just do Cumberland Hill, is that permissible under the under the waves agenda? Do you believe? I don't see. I don't see a problem with it. As, you, as long as you amend it. Amend the resolution or amend the agenda? Amend the resolution. Okay. So, not dissimilar to the way you amended the policy with respect to, I think the word was full. Well, I amended, I, right, I amended that, that policy, but this one, so it doesn't, I think this one is like, Completely different, but that's it. Doesn't matter. You're okay with that. I mean, this one is. But I, but I guess the actual resolution that's in front of us that must get advertised as well with the agenda or no? So the, the actual resolution. So now the res the resolution that was part of that that accompanied the agenda is in the one that we are going to be that the amendment here that we're making is. It's, no, it's pretty different. That's okay we, to have that kind of a sweeping change. It's only I, maybe it is. So I'm not certain that anything accompanied the agenda. The agenda is what the public got, unless I'm missing something. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion to accept the resolution that the school committee uh, received in the email and. Number that SCPR 10 2014 18A and uh, have it be a resolution empowering the school committee to award the cornerstone restoration of Barrington, Rhode Island to perform chimney repairs in an amount not to exceed $11,500. <coughs> so, Mr. Mutter moves to amend as presented to uh, uh, SCPR 10 2014 18A. With the language you presented, do I have a second? Second by Mr. DeMonica. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Those opposed? And that passes 6 0. Mr. Uh, so if you could look at you, you, the documentation that did come uh, in the packet, you'll notice that uh, cornerstone restoration was a little bit of this. This was uh, the bid allowed you to separate the uh, two elementary schools and 
there was some, uh, discussion to combine them. Uh, I believe that the administration has chosen not to. So Cornerstone, we, uh, the bid of 11.5 reflects the low bidder. Mr. Mutter moves passage of SCPR 10 2014-8A as amended. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fiorello. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion and a vote to approve homeschool instruction requests for the 14-15 school year. Mr. Mitchell? I don't believe we have any this evening, Madam Chair. No, there are none. That's correct. Thank you. Next item, personnel recommendations. This is Hello. Hello. Okay, so I just have a few uh, recommendations for you this evening. The first is a, resi a resignation. Uh, I request the advice and consent of the school committee on the resignation of Suzette Blaze, who is a grade one teacher at Community Elementary School, effective September 10 of 2014. Uh, Ms. Blaze is resigning um, after 25 years with the school department. Pleasure with me. Motion by Mr. DeMonica. Second by Mr. Denon. Any further discussion? A big thank you for the woman. 25 years is a long time. A long time. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6-0. Thank you. I have two appointments for you this evening. Uh, I request the advice and consent of the school committee on the appointment of David Garron, Library and Media Specialist for the Cumberland School Department. This would be effective uh, October 15th of 2014. Uh, he's full-time, he's a step in for master's, and he would come in at the 22% copay. And additionally, Sharon McMahon-Joyle, as an ELL teacher for the Cumberland School Department, effective 10-20-2014. Uh, Ms. McMahon-Joyle will come uh, to us as a full-time ELL teacher, step forward with the master's, and also with the 22% copay. Pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. Mutter. Second by Mr. Fiorello. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Next item school committee comments, school liaison reports. Anyone this evening? No? I just wanted to recognize former school committee member Duffy.
and uh, the Cumberland Public Schools budget presentation. So, of course, you were there, but these are, so I just want you to know that these are not, these, these actually have handwritten notes. These are one of a kind. So, uh, there's, um, so I, I'm sure you probably kept, I don't know, maybe wrote these. I don't even really know. Uh, but in any event, this, uh, this comes with the whole packet, and there are actually some handwritten notes in the back, uh, which represent my daughter was doing some investigative work for me on the, uh, on the uh, ECAP scores. So, so you get, that's actually part of this as well. So I just didn't want you to feel slighted. So that is my card in here uh, for you on that one. And then I think this one actually predates Ms. Bolio's um, involvement, I believe. This one, this one. <laughs> and I don't want to take this as people's business. I'm taking this shouldn't really be on the agenda. I should be doing this off the agenda. My last thing is so I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, we have some, yeah, we have some, some great shots here of a former school committee nice. chair, Mr. Costa. Yeah. <laughs> this was a common school by 1996. And the reason that I chose this was because that's basically when I was first elected. So I wanted to leave you with you know, something that's as old as my tenure. You know, I did leave a couple of times. And there's a nice section here about citizen celebrity that I did scour and you're not on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry to have cast that on to you. So. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm here with this. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess, should I let you say something? And then I, I hold some of my remarks? Or should I just? Yeah, I think I'm going to hold it. It's your night. I'm going to hold it. <laughs> so, I appreciate the thought. And I will cherish this. Um, there's no doubt a lot of effort went into it. And I, I can't wait to see all the mullets, count all the mullets that are probably in here, because I can see there's at least one. So I brought some old fashioned slides. I didn't do a PowerPoint. But what I brought were the Bond campaign slides, because I carried these in my car. <laughs> But what I would suggest the committee do is take a look at them. Because it represents a few things. A lot of hard work by a lot of people. But it also represents um, the first time I ever took your advice. And quite frankly, it was this big, ugly picture of the science classroom. And I had all these grand, jazzy ads. And you kept saying to me, make it simple. It's all I can understand is something simple. <laughs> so these are for you. I don't quite remember it that way. Yeah, I, do. <laughs> I do. Yes. I have one concern. Uh, Mr. Mutter's uh, collection of, of items gives me pause in terms of what he can fit in his home. I'm not sure how we <laughs> see how we, uh, how we archive all of these different They pieces. could be donated. And feel free. I, I, I will not be offended. But I do have some, I have some notes. Um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, it's funny that I think, uh, yeah, this is when I, I, I met uh, you and Ms. Teal and, and Ms. Edwards. And, you know, you could tell right away that, you know, we had an instant connection, that we thought exactly the same. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was right away, right away. So, um, you know, so it, it, is, uh, it is nice, however, to, uh, to end it on, on that note that it was, it was an interesting time. I had been out for a couple of, well, at least that one term or something, and I was always struck by, you know, their passion and their uh, just the genuine concern that they had for uh, education. So it was nice to ultimately be on the board with Ms. Polio and uh, Ms. Teal. Uh, so you know, you don't always get you know the chance to call it a day at a good time. So it was uh, I'm appreciative that it did and that you were the chair at that time. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so I have some notes, and it won't take me that long. But what I did have the chance to do was to go through some of the Valley Breeze archives. And I found it pretty fascinating, the, the history. And I think at one point I had said to you, don't let this go to your head, but you reminded me of Warren Buffett, because Warren Buffett has these great analogies, and he just drives this message home. And you've been able to drive this message home for the longest time. And I had been on an airplane reading this Warren Buffett thing about the connection. It 
analogies. And it just it reminded me of you. So I think what you've been able to do is really create that energy that, that, that drives change and moves people. So now we'll get to the written part here. So I said during your inaugural speech for the mayor in 2011, you posed the question, do we have it in us to compete? Now all of this stuff here, and I wish I had highlighted it and given it to you, it's mostly stuff you said, and in between I just connected some sentences. So throughout your long tenure as a counselor and school board member, you pushed every school stakeholder to be competitive, to be better than that. I could do quotes. To question our scores, efficiencies, our activities, our willingness to address our faults, our interest in collaborating. You set the tone by stating, quote, the journey is better than the end. The journey of our the journey of setting our aim high and striving to catch excellence in the most difficult of times begins today. The end we will be at two years from now is all in our hands. You also admonished the board with a quote from Confucius when you became school board chair. And you said, when it's obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals, adjust the action steps. Your remarks are always genuine, and you never did it for the sound bite, albeit some of the quotes are priceless, <laughs> or for personal gain. You are and are always were relentless. Like when you said, if we demand meaningful outcomes for students, we should start with ourselves. We are a small town board. It's an important job, but that doesn't make us important. Another time you reminded us, if we're to make our best argument, we need to be united, and we're nowhere near that. There's something in the air that stops us from getting there. Leaders should all be in agreement, and we're not there yet. You also had no qualms in pointing out when we were kicking the can or avoiding the obvious. Uh, you set the bar to ensure we were more procedure and pro process driven, and I'm sure the quotes from today's meeting mean you might want to come back and help us out some more. <coughs> I won't accept a line item like that. When we send it, it's real. I wouldn't want anyone on the council to vote in favor of something that isn't complete. I want them to know as much of the, as they can know about this budget so they own the vote. They're partners with us. As we know, education is more than rolling out the ball, and it requires each to give it our best shot. Where are we taking this district? We need to make some bold moves whether we can, whether, whether or not we can afford to. The district needs to set a direction and a tone. It has to be more transparent and more passionate about improving student outcomes in every facet of education. And just before that, you had quoted, uh, we, we were talking about full day kindergarten and the interest around that, and it didn't quite work out the way we had hoped. You said, I actually expected an interesting discussion about full day K and the possibility. I didn't expect walls going up. I ran, to the, I ran for this position to talk about education. That's what I'm going to do. Excuse me. And then the bold moves began, began to happen. And while I doubt you, are no, you no longer, quote, lay awake at night worrying that you follow every ordinance and every procedure like you did in 2002, You've evolved into worrying more about math scores, math coaches, and full day kindergarten. But beyond that, you've helped us dream that we could do better. You reminded us that getting it right was far more important than being right. How many times have we heard that? Everybody raised their hand a bunch of times. You remind us that we were once a hallmark for education and, and being blunt beyond blunt, scolding our schools and our stakeholders for low proficiency when you said, I don't want to go through any more spin talk. I'm watching the scores go down. I'm a big public school advocate. I don't want to hear about per pupil costs and how we rank nationally. I want to hear how we're going to improve Cumberland. You were able to say what many knew but couldn't or wouldn't say or put on paper. Not only that, you knew how to lead us, and you knew how to command respect, and you knew how to allow us to dream about a better future for our students. As Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking forward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. The relentless grousing has improved our dots by raising our math scores, improving graduation rates, improving the rate of college acceptance, adding math coaches, improving our facilities to make our school spaces equitable and competitive, and adding full day kindergarten, Chromebooks, and beyond. You may be just another used car salesman from South of 295. There's just 
one of seven votes and who's no one's lackey. But you've used your leadership and your votes very wisely and effectively and have moved us away from continuously being put in a position to fail. Thank you for letting us dream. You are a quintessential leader and this town owes you much gratitude for your years of public service. I thank you for your leadership, your guidance, and your passion for education.
that um, you called me dangerous, <laughs> and I'm not sure I believe that. But uh, it might that's be not true. That is, that, that's a rumor. I was much more afraid of uh, Ms. Evans. <laughs> uh, that's, that, that is definitely true. Um, yes, just for the record. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, do we have an executive session this evening? We do. Excellent. I need a motion to adjourn. I will adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Munner. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And we are adjourned at 9.02 on a 5 to 1.